Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Real View podcast. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. Joining me is my co host, Carrie R. Blaster. With us today is our very special guest. Realtor of Fairfield, Ohio, veteran John Prasinski, Good Neighbor Award winner of 2019. John, Carrie, thank you both for being here with me today. Thank you, Allison. Lots of things to talk about with you today, John. Lots of things that you've done. But first, we have our standard question that we ask all of our guests. As you know, the name of the podcast is The Real View, and we like to ask our guests, what is the best view that they have ever had? So what is it for you? Okay, I really have two, but we'll start with the first one, and that is when I was in the United States Air Force back in 1985, I won a flight in the back seat of an F-16. And so I was stationed out at Hill Air Force Base in Utah, and I got to fly for about an hour and a half over the salt flats between Nevada and Utah. And that was a sight to behold. That's also, awesome. yeah, yeah, it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. And I don't know what it would say for my career for me to say that was the highlight of my career, but it really was. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds awesome. It sounds yeah. awesome. <laughs> and then the second one is I work with a veteran charity called Blue Skies for the Good Guys and Gals Warrior Foundation. And I got to um, skydive at 14,000 feet over Middletown Airport, Middletown, Ohio. And um, that was a wonderful experience also. Oh, my gosh. Kudos to you for doing that. Is that. Awesome. The view from the aircraft with just the bubble on the F-16 and the view from free falling and under canopy in a skydive, two entirely different things, but they're both the enormity of our universe is appreciated differently from both of those views. Yeah, absolutely. Like just for a minute, skydiving, like what I would think I would be so terrified. I'm very afraid of heights, but like when you are falling, what do you like at first? Are you just kind of frozen? Like, what do you look at? Like, how, how was that for you? Well, interestingly enough, I did it the first time in Utah back in 1981. It was a whole different experience there than it was a few years ago in Middletown because in Middletown, I don't have a skydiving license. So I was with a tandem instructor and I get all the fun, but he has all the responsibility. So I was able to keep my adrenaline in check and take in the moment, which I'm not usually good at, but you know, I, I sort of, you know, knew what I was going to go and do. And so I just tried to keep my adrenaline in check and, uh, soaked it all in and just the enormity of the universe at 14,000 feet and you're falling up to 125 miles an hour is pretty much a rush. And it has nothing to do with being fearful of the fall or of heights. It has everything to do with the excitement. And for me, you never feel more alive under anything but a circumstance like that. So yeah, absolutely. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I encourage everyone to try it at least once. <laughs> okay. I would like to think okay. that I'm brave enough to like go up there and, you know, I'm sure I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. I would get up and then they would open that door and I would look down and say, nope. <laughs> and run. Well, they tell you that in the aircraft, no, 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 sounds like go, go, go. So if you don't <laughs> think you're going to do it. Don't get in the aircraft. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Very true. I, I feel like I would need someone to like, Push, push you, you. Like, go, yeah. yeah, right. Like just, yeah, do it. <laughs> so you've mentioned this, and maybe this is why you're not as terrified as I am about jumping out of an airplane. But you served. You served our country in yes. the Air Force from 1980 to 1989. We would love to hear about your journey to the Air Force and then how you got in to real estate. Are you originally from Ohio? Is yes, that where you? Yes. Re- okay, so you're originally yeah. from Ohio and decided to join the Air Force. How old were you? What's your story? Okay, so in 1980, I was in high school. I wasn't the best of students. I really did not have an aspiration to go to college. 
I worked at a YMCA and I knew all of the recruiters because they all came into the Y and worked out. My father was an engineer at General Electric, so he was around aviation. I talked to all the recruiters except for the Navy recruiter. I told him I was not stopping in his office because I just could not imagine being on a ship. <laughs> so I thanked him, but told him that I couldn't do it. So I talked to the other three recruiters. I ended up in the Air Force, which was a really good place for me to be. And I went to my basic training down in the Lackland Air Force Base, Texas, August of 1980. Then went to tech school in Illinois. I want to say October through December of 1980. And then I went to my first base January of 81, which was Hill Air Force Base in Utah. And I was there from January of 81 to July of 85. And then in July of 85, I went back to the base in Illinois and I became an instructor at that tech school. I taught aircraft fuel systems maintenance. So working on fuel tanks of aircraft. Very cool. Yeah. So in 1988, sometime mid-year, I came home and was visiting my parents and visiting my friends here in Fairfield. And one of my friends, her father owned a real estate company. He was a real estate broker. And so my friend says to me, so what are you going to do? And I said, I think I want to get out and come home. And she says, so what's your plan? I said, well, I'm putting a resume together and I guess I'll find a job. And she says to me, why don't you get your real estate license and come to work with us? And I said, oh, I could do that. I mean, I had no yeah, idea. Yeah. I mean, my 32 year career here was built on an invitation. Wow. I am a manager of an office. I've never had a resume. Wow. You've just built it on your own. And how did you get there? Like, so I assume you went to work for this firm. Yes. I went to work for the brokerage that invited me to get into the real estate business. And I was there for about four years. They were just very, very good to me. And around my fourth year into the business, Star One opened an office in Fairfield. And I knew some of the owners of Star One not from real estate, but from when I was a kid. That had some credibility. And so I moved over to Star One in 93 and I've been with Star One ever since. I had never aspired to be the manager of a real estate office, just to be perfectly honest with you. But I'll tell you what happened. When I came to Star One, our broker's name was George Meinhardt and George sort of mentored me. And I really felt like he was a second father to me. In 2005, May 9th, so Sunday was 16 years ago, my son who joined the Marines, he was killed in Iraq. Probably somewhere in 2007 or 2008, I have a terrible concept of time, so feel free to laugh at me. It's okay. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> George calls me and says, would you come talk to me? And I said, sure. My wife, Carol, my business partner, she says, well, what does George want to talk to you about? I said, don't know. He called me and asked me to come talk to him. I'm going to go talk to him. So he says to me, hey, um, the manager's going to leave the office. She's moving on to something else. We want you to be the manager of the office. And I just out loud laughed, not being disrespectful, but that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and he says, that's what I expected. And then he tells me, he says, I'll tell you why you should do this. And I said, OK, I'll listen to you. I respected him. Years before my son died, he lost a son, Danny, to melanoma cancer. And I watched him walk through that. Mm. And when Taylor died, he sort of came and stood next to me mm. and sort of walked with me. So he says, I bet there's days you don't feel like getting out of bed. I said, of course, you know that. Then he tells me the story. He says his son, Danny, was a librarian at downtown Cincinnati. He said, I bought a memorial bench in front of the library. He said, some days I get up and go to work and I go sit on that bench because that's all I have in me. And he says, I sit there and I watch the world just walk past me. And he says, so I'm asking you to do this because I think this would be the kick in the pants that you need to move on with your life. Mm. And I said, ugh, because I really, I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, just to be honest with you. So I go home and I tell Carol, I said, you're not going to believe this. Our manager's leaving. I didn't even know because I don't participate in the rumor mill. I said, he wants me to be the manager. And she looked at me and she says, you told me you never aspired to be the manager of real estate office. And I said, no, it's like herding cats. I've never aspired to do it. I said, but I'm going to do it. And here's why. And I told her what he told me. And she says, man, he got you good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, and it, and it seems like it worked out for the best. And, yes. and you eventually became really involved in your local board there and, and um, was president for a little while. Is that, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yeah. Tell us about that. 
Let's go back real quick to 1989, though. When I went to my first broker, and that brokerage is Combs and Thomas Realty, both Courtney Combs and Harry Thomas pretty much expected every one of the agents to involve themselves in the association. And so I didn't realize that it wasn't common, and I just... You didn't have a choice. (laughs) Yeah, I participated with everybody else. So I served on the board of directors at the Hamilton Fairfield Oxford Board and then became president in 2010 of the Hamilton Fairfield Oxford Board and then was part of a committee that merged three boards together, the Warren County, Middletown, and Hamilton Fairfield Oxford, which is now known as the Butler Warren Association. That's where I won the Good Neighbor Award originally to compete at the state level. And so I believe I was the good neighbor there in 2018 or something like that. I don't remember exactly. So that's sort of been my my journey. I mean, it's I've just always participated one way or another. Now, I am term limited out of the board of directors currently. So I'm serving on a task force and also chairperson of a, a scholarship committee. But, you know, that's pretty much my journey with realtors. Well, we're lucky to have you. I know your your local board is lucky to Thank have you. you as well. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. Let's get into the Good Neighbor Award. So the Good Neighbor Award is a award from the Ohio Realtors Office to a realtor every year. Um, This award is presented. It's awarded to a realtor who provides exemplary community service and plays a critical role in giving back to their community. And I feel like this is such a small statement and explanation for what you do and what you are involved with in your community on a daily basis, in which we will get into that the many ways that you are very active and involved in your community. But let's start with what you won it for that year. And you mentioned about your son, Taylor, who was a Marine and was killed in the explosion in Iraq in, in 2005. So tell us about how you turned this this terrible tragedy into something positive and everlasting and that is keeping his memory alive. All right. Well, first off, it really wasn't me and any grand idea that I had. So the first thing that happened was that since I inquire did a story on Taylor and it was on the front page, halfway into the article, the author of the story labeled him a number, which really hurt my feelings. And I gave the author of the story a benefit of the doubt and I finished the story. At the end of the story, it said um, there were three times as many injured or wounded than had passed. And so I said to my wife, Carol, I said, that's it. We can't do anything for Taylor. So let's make something good out of this. And so for us, there was really no grand plan or vision. It was just trying to be positive out of negative. It was trying to take tragedy and turning it into triumph for us. I mean, you know, our world is full of good and evil. And I want to focus on the good. You know, I honest to God believe love wins. Okay. How you take that is up to you, but that's what I believe. So anyhow, this article was like the second or third day after we had been notified. And so we're waiting for Taylor's body to come back from Iraq through Dover, Delaware, the military mortuary. And I couldn't sleep. So I get on the computer and I Google veteran charities, which by the way, there's 54,000 of them. 54,000 oh veteran charities. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I was shocked. I had yeah. no idea. I had no idea. I'm a veteran. And I you were know. a veteran. Yeah, you are a veteran. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I got out and went to work in real estate and real estate consumed my life basically. And so I just, I didn't know. So anyhow, one popped up that had a phone number, which was a local area code. So I took the contact us, I sent a message and my computer just crashed. So I couldn't sleep. I'm already upset, I guess. So I literally had the the computer in my hands and I was going to throw it out the window, right? 
And my wife, Carol, walks in and she's like, what are you doing? I told her the story. She said, put it down. We'll figure this out in the morning. So in the morning, I get up and the phone rings and it's a gentleman from the veteran charity. And he says, hey, I got your message. I don't know why you're reaching out to us, but I asked him to come over and he came over and talked to us about his charity. And right when he was getting ready to leave and he was finishing up, he says, I didn't come here to ask you for anything. I came here because you asked me to come here. And he said, you got more important things to do than worry about us. We're going to let you be if in a month from now, a year from now or whatever, you want to reach back out to us and have another conversation. God bless you. We'll have that conversation. So I decided after he left that we would, instead of collecting flowers in lieu of flowers, we would set up a fund and we would ask people to contribute. And we were going to make a donation. And that donation went to an organization called Impact a Hero, which basically provides financial and emotional support to those wounded in the war on terror. And so that started it all. And then an anonymous citizen read Taylor's story in the newspaper and went down to the Fairfield Community Foundation and started the scholarship fund anonymously. Wow. Yeah. So then what happened was a friend of mine that I ride motorcycles with, he's a mortgage loan officer. He and his wife come to our house to visit as we're waiting for Taylor's remains to come. And they say, hey, you know, we want to we wanna do a motorcycle ride to honor Taylor. And so at that point we were like, oh my God, we can't do that. You know, we're, we got way too many things on our plate, whatever. And they're like, no, 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 we're not asking you to, we're asking for your permission to, can we do it? And so they did it. And then years later we got involved. We've been to all the events, but I mean, we got involved and that is now Ride for Heroes, which we did last year virtually. That's interesting. How did you do that? Well, it's hard to explain, but because of the COVID restrictions, we couldn't get the permit to gather. And my way of thinking is never say die. There's always a way, push the limits, whatever, right? And we just couldn't. You know, we didn't want to create problems for the businesses or the parking lot where we normally meet and whatnot. And so a friend of mine up in Miamisburg, they lost their son in Afghanistan and they do a 5K every Memorial Day weekend called the Rockies Run for Freedom. And they had to go virtually. So they used this run platform. And so I contacted a guy that I had been put in contact with, with the survivor outreach services through the Ohio National Guard, who owns a run platform. And I said, hey, you haven't really done this for a motorcycle ride, but what's your thought? And he's like, let's give it a shot. And so we did this virtual run platform for a motorcycle ride, which a lot of people wouldn't participate in because it was way too confusing. But the good news is we had enough people to participate in. We were able to do something good and less than 10 of us gathered. And I would imagine there were other groups of less than 10. And we went out and we stopped at either veterans memorials or memorial highway signs for veterans and took pictures and posted them on our Facebook page and things of that sort. And so those monies went to an organization called Loose Guys for Good Guys and Gals Warrior Foundation. And what they do is they are putting together an event or they have been putting together an event for the last seven years. They couldn't do it last year with anticipation. They're going to do it this year in August, but it's just a gathering of veterans, combat injured or wounded, Purple Heart or not, and Gold Star families like ours to just build a community of veterans where you have someone that you can reach out to should you be in need or struggling or just need to talk. And so the way that we do it is we invite everybody in to come and participate. And one of the the founders of Blue Skies for the Good Guys and Gals Warrior Foundation, they own a skydiving school. And so we take anybody that wants to go skydiving. They bring different aircraft into the airport and we fly in different aircraft, helicopters, whatnot, biplane. Biplane came in from Xenia. It was really a cool experience. And, you know, just try to build camaraderie and friendship around doing something fun and exhilarating and adventurous. And then a three gun shoot up at the Miamisburg Sportsman's Club, sitting around a campfire and shooting the bull. So that's sort of what we have done. We've also used the Ride for Heroes to benefit a, an organization called Four Paws for Abilities, where they do service dogs. You know, we've just tried to do good things with that particular event. 
I love that. When I saw that one of those charities was for the service dogs for injured veterans, I just, I love that because I'm a huge animal lover and the fact that you're able to support that. Yeah, that's, that's great. So this anonymous citizen started the scholarship fund Mm -hmm. after hearing, after hearing the story. Yeah. And then you and your wife, Carol, eventually took it over and you've been providing thousands of dollars to Fairview students since then. Well, actually, we didn't really. My sister came to me. She and I had been participating in some 5Ks. I'm not really a runner. If I stood up, you would see that. I'm a high school wrestler. Join the non-running club. I totally get it. (laughs) But we were participating in some 5Ks and she came along and she says, hey, because they started the scholarship fund, let's do a 5K. So for 15 years, we did a Memorial 5K run and contributed the funds to the scholarship fund at the Fairfield Community Foundation and also supported an organization called the Joe Knoxall Miracle League Fields. And as we started supporting them and they built their fields, they called us and said, hey, we have put speakers into our parking lot so you can bring your event to our facility. And so the Joe Knoxall Miracle League Field is this. Joe Nuxall was the youngest to ever pitch a major league baseball game. Okay. So Joe from Hamilton, Fairfield area, pitched a major league baseball game for the Cincinnati Reds at age 15 in the 1940s because all the players were drafted to go fight World War II. Wow. Yeah. And so Joe always did lots of community service things and philanthropic things in our community. And one of his sons, Kim, was one of my son's Taylor's gym teacher in elementary school or phys ed teacher, whatever the proper name is now. Anyhow, we started supporting that because it's Taylor worked with the kids that had developmentally handicaps when he was in high school. And that was a cause that he really felt, you know, called to do. And so the Miracle League field fell right into what would be his alley, so to speak. So when they started that going on after 2005, we helped participate with the building of those fields. And it's fields where children and young adults from all abilities can come play baseball. So it's a rubberized play field. And now they have a wheelchair accessible nine hole putt putt course, amongst other things, like a bocce. That's court. so cool. Yeah. So we raised money to support those causes through our 5K which we couldn't do last year because we couldn't get a permit to gather, even though it was outside and we were like, oh no, we can keep the distance. They're like, you have hundreds of people. There's no way we can permit this. And they didn't. We figure we had a good 15 year run. It probably won't come back. We'll probably move on to something bigger and better, but we had committed to the Miracle League field that we would help them raise $50,000 for a legacy fund, which would keep the field going beyond our generations. And to date, we are, we had helped them not because of us, but because of our community and how our community has supported us. It's over $200,000 in oh the legacy gosh. fund. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. And so, yeah. thank you, yeah, it is. And they've been challenged under COVID restrictions too, to be able to hold their events and let the kids play. And so they certainly need the help to keep that going. But the anonymous citizen, we found out who he was. We, we basically badgered the foundation people until they told us who he was. <laughs> he was instrumental in building the, he and his family were instrumental in building the Joe Knoxall Miracle League fields. Wow. And so to date this month, we will give our 69th scholarship to a Fairfield senior high student going to college. Isn't that amazing? And yeah. Minimum of $1,000. A lot of them were 2500 when we had the ability to generate more. But hey, we're in a situation now. Yeah, well, we're in a situation now with the Community Foundation where it's going to fund itself, even if we don't do anything else to contribute. That's so awesome. this year, we're only giving one. Next year, we should be able to generate enough income from the fund alone in an investment to do two $1,000 scholarships. That so. is awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. And I love to, when the students are applying for the scholarship, that they write an essay on what freedom means to them, which I think that is so cool and so creative. So was there any that you read or or heard about that really stuck out to you in some of their responses? Yeah. You know, we've been doing this now 16 years or 15 years, excuse me. So I'm on the go like most realtors. 
I always have so much going on that I don't let the details get in my way, for lack of a better way to put it. And so our committee to decide who wins this scholarship is members of our family and teachers at the school, because we want to make sure that we're getting and giving good input on who should be receiving it. It's not need based. But we look at the um, essays, 500 words or less about what freedom and patriotism mean. And it's amazing how creative high school students can be in how they view what patriotism or what freedom means to them. So it's always enjoyable every year. And some years we have, you know, 30 applicants. Some years we might have five. It's all good. The interesting thing is the kids graduating high school today don't remember 9-11. Wow. That's interesting. You're right. They don't. Yeah, there's some college alive. students who don't who don't yeah. remember it or were two years old, you know, when it happened, which is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so it's changed over these years. I will tell you the most memorable one was by far the most well written essay, and we couldn't give him a scholarship. Why? Okay, yeah, I'm glad you asked. On, Here's why? what happened. <laughs> he received a congressional appointment to Annapolis Naval Academy. He didn't need our thousand dollars. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. But by far the best essay ever. But yet we also had some other good things happen. So we had a young man who came to us, wrote a well-written essay, and he clearly was going to win. But on his application, it said, I've been selected for three different universities. My goal is to go to the Citadel but my father just lost his job. I'm probably not going to be able to make raise enough money to get to the Citadel. So my client, who is my favorite funeral director, served my family since 1984, is a Citadel grad. So I call him and I say, hey, I'm going to send you this essay. I want you to read the essay. So he reads the essay and he's like, wow, this is unbelievable. This is awesome. What is this? And I told him that we have a young man who is going to win one of our scholarships, but our thousand dollars isn't going to get him to the Citadel. What can we do to get this kid to the Citadel? And with a little bit of our help, not because of us, but with a little bit of our help, that young man got to go to the Citadel and graduated. He's now an army officer. He's at the University of Dayton in the ROTC program as Isn't a commander. What a phenomenal story. I mean, these are fantastic yeah. stories. Yeah. And I love how you say with a little bit of help, I love like hearing this. It just, it makes me feel so rewarded and I'm not even the one who's doing this, you know, boots on the ground work that you're doing. What has this meant to you that you're so involved with all these very many different causes that we've discussed? What does it mean to you and how has it changed your life? Well, grief is a debilitating emotion, I guess, the best way to put it. We all lose people in our lives. And depending upon the relationship that you have with that person, you know, it's harder at different times. But for me, I didn't want to sit back feeling sorry for myself. I'm a Christian. God's promise to me is that I'm going to see Taylor again. I live in that hope. Taylor would not want me to be depressed and not functioning. And so, you know, I taught him to be the optimist. I taught him to be nice to everybody. I just want to do what I taught him. And so what we've done is we've, for me, I've immersed myself into a bunch of it, yet working every day in my real estate business because that's my bread and butter. But I did it sort of because I didn't know what else to do. And so it's been healing for us, but it's also taught me a huge lesson in balance. I don't know a single realtor who can tell me I have a balanced life. <laughs> and so <Right. laughs> because I was doing so much with, with that and so much with my career, there were other parts of my life that were not so good. And I had to learn when to say yes and when to say no and when to turn it on and when to turn it off, so to speak. And so for me, it's just continued life lessons. But the most important thing that it's given me is the opportunity to, to honor Taylor, to do something positive out of something so negative. And really, when I get to tell his story, his memories live on. If I don't tell his story, his memory's not going to live on. And I mean, what's what's the worst thing that could happen? Somebody never mentioned his name again. That's heartbreaking. So we just try to live our life and do good. 
and sell some houses. You're, you're doing amazing. And I know your son is up there uh, smiling down on you and is proud of his mom and dad every single day. And before we wrap things up, the Fairfield community must just be really lucky to have some amazing people who give back and care about their community so much because there's a few other realtors who are doing some pretty amazing things down in that area. So tell us a little bit about, about some of um, the others who are making an impact. Yeah, I appreciate you asking. So with the Butler Warren Association for 2020, our Good Neighbor Award winner is Lisa Morales. And Lisa Morales and her team have involved themselves for many years with the um, Red Kettle Fund She's been so involved with the Salvation Army for years and years, and she's just done such great work. And I'm just so proud of her. And I just want to encourage everybody to uh, do your little bit like Lisa has done. But then also our neighboring association, Cincinnati Area Board of Realtors, Kelly Whalen, was the recipient of the 2020 Good Neighbor Award for CABR. And Kelly is part of the Star One family, and she is the founder of an organization called Team Hughes. And she basically is the team mother to the basketball team at Hughes High School and has done remarkable work to help these kids physically, educationally, and emotionally. She's got uh, lots of people to mentor these kids and get some of these kids to be able to play basketball in college. And so she's done some great work. That's amazing. I love how involved everyone is. And it really just shows realtors care about their communities. It's not just, you know, the place where we live and work, but it's a place where we want to give back to and invest to. So I, I just love home. hearing. Yeah, exactly. And and so thank you for all the work that you do on behalf of realtors, on behalf of your son. And you truly are making your community a better place to to live, work, and play in every single day. And you are the embodiment of the Good Neighbor Award. And that's why when I read that description, I said, that is such a small, <laughs> small sentence for what you embody and, and live every day. So it was my pleasure, our pleasure for having you on today. Thanks so much for joining us to our listeners. Thank you guys so much for listening. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Humble Pod production. Stay humble.